Bill said, and it's on the screen, 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse 1 through to chapter 2, verse 11. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins And purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother and sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Have you ever seen a church fight? (laughs) Maybe you've been in the fight. I hope not. Um. To be, to see a church fight is pretty horrible, isn't it? We see people doing things, uh, speaking things, acting in ways that uh, do not reflect the God they worship. They fail to live out that Christ-shaped life, which is what should be shaping. People can get passionate about all sorts of things, can't they? You know, paint colours, carpet, property, you know, or the time has moved or, you know, uh, there wasn't enough skim milk or uh, weren't enough, you know, options or... You know, one of the big things, and sadly, is music, isn't it? That creates a lot of tension in churches. And how bad is that when it should be the very thing that we're united in singing praises to God. What makes conflict in the church bad, maybe bad in another context, I don't know if it is, if it seems to be, is that the issue can become more important than Christ. Now, anyone involved in the conflict would totally deny that, (laughs) but the speech, uh, the tone, uh, behaviour actually reveals priorities. 
where their priorities lie. Now, I've seen certainly differences of opinion. You can't really help that. I've seen a few unfortunate things in churches. But thankfully, I haven't seen major splits, you know, big things that wreck churches. I, not my experience, praise God. Um, but I've also seen wonderful things. I've, I've seen people with, with the humility and the maturity to forgive to turn the other cheek, to apologise and to give and receive grace and um, come to that place of reconciliation. What we truly believe, which might be different to what we claim to believe, uh, as we see in this passage, is going to shape our lives. And what we believe, therefore, is going to shape our values. And that's going to shape our behavior. And that's going to shape our speech and relationships. And ultimately, what we believe is going to affect the quality of our life. What we believe is really important, therefore, to have Good belief, correct belief, belief that's grounded in the Bible. But the sad reality of these three letters, John 1, John 2, John and 3, John, is that they are written to a group of churches that are in a bitter fight. And we see in this passage today that claims are made but reality is quite different to those claims. John is dealing with a heresy here, which is a false belief about God. And here in particular, it's a false belief about the nature of Christ. And this false belief has split the church apart. But he's also writing... We see in a few verses here for his joy, for the joy of the, the fellowship together, our joy. He's writing that believers won't sin, that they know they are forgiven when they come in confession. And that ultimately, he's writing, as he says in the last chapter, that all this stuff's been written that they can know, have the security of eternal life. John wants to shine a light on authentic Christianity in these, in these books. And though John writes in the context of countering these heretics, he doesn't do it with a lot of sort of theological depth, say for, you might get in Romans, for example, or some of Paul's writings, you know, that the, the can get pretty heavy. I mean, if you read this passage, it wasn't easy to read, was it? It's a bit, you know, tricky. But he's, what he does, he doesn't get bogged down in theology. The approach he takes, despite the sort of difficult syntax and sentence structure, is quite simple in that it's not theologically based in a sense, although that's what he's refuting, a heresy. He's saying... You'll see it by the evidence, by the practice. You're going to see it in the practice. And so he focuses on practical things, like fellowship. You know if that's working or not. <laughs> like love, that's a big one. Like walking in obedience, like forgiveness. And he doesn't go sequentially through topics these topics, either he sort of spirals round and round. We keep visiting them in each, in each chapter. Now, this John was most likely the fisherman that Jesus called to follow him. He's the same guy who wrote the fourth book in the Bible, the Gospel of John. And John has left that, that area of Israel and he's moved across. He's been there now for some years to western Turkey, to this area of Ephesus. We know Paul visited. 
and he's been leading a group of churches there. And he's been there for some time now, and he's, he's an old guy at this stage of his life. But he's seen that these once unified congregations have been torn apart from within. And it must have devastated him after pouring so much of his life into these churches, into these people. This group had split off and left the church and now now they were hostile to those that remained. Most theological errors, uh, which often form cults or groups such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, center around the nature of Christ. Now, we understand from Scripture that Christ is fully God and fully human. Now, that's not necessarily easy to understand. But we do see that concept in many places in the Bible. We see it, we hear it in Jesus' own words when he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. We see it in Philippians chapter 2, where it says that though he was God, he did not think that equality with God was something to be grasped, but he made himself human. We see it in the first few verses of the Gospel of John, where he talks about the Word was with God, the Word was God, and yet the Word became flesh. Uh, We see it here in 1 John, where he immediately launches into the nature of Christ. He says, that which was from the beginning, he's echoing his, his Gospel letter, wasn't it? In the beginning was the Word, Word. A lot of similarity here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. So we see just in those couple of verses that John stresses the divinity of Jesus. He was from the beginning. He was the word of life. He's described as the eternal life and that he was with the Father. And yet John also stresses here, he highlights that Jesus was a man who came into history because we have seen him with our eyes. We have looked at him. We have even touched him. He appeared. We have seen him and we testify to him, about him. So John again presents those both facets of the nature of Christ. Now, the group that had split from the church had their false beliefs. They denied that Jesus was the Son of God. They denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. And they denied that Jesus was this prophesied, this long-awaited-for Messiah or Christ or Saviour. They claimed that Jesus was an ordinary man and that God's Spirit came down upon him temporarily during his ministry, but then left him before the crucifixion. Now, you may or may not think that that's such a big deal, but ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have bad consequences. And their bad theology has significant bad ripples that flow out from that misunderstanding. Because Jesus was not God, but just a man, for these people, his life and his teachings uh, were very much less significant. Didn't matter that much. And because they were influenced by this Greek idea, this Greek thinking, or some 
some areas of Greek thought at the time, that they thought material things, including the human body, was bad and evil, and that spiritual things were good and superior. So from, for them, the idea that Christ would appear in flesh, which was bad, was ridiculous or abhorrent to them. These people are called Gnostics. It comes from the Greek word to know. Uh, and it basically means that they had a secret knowledge through special and direct access to God. And because they emphasised the spirit, they would seek or they claim to have had these mystical spiritual experiences or have received special words of knowledge, of revelation from God, which made them superior, which means they were forming an exclusive club, not a church, though they saw themselves as part of the church. They saw themselves as Christian. But also, because the flesh didn't matter, what they did with their bodies didn't really matter either. You can probably see where this is going. So they would eat, drink and be merry. They would engage in sex outside of marriage, uh, clearly against God's will. And it didn't really matter because, well, the body's perishing anyway, so the body's just evil anyway, so it doesn't matter. So they claimed to know God, but do whatever. And you can see how this might be pretty attractive for many people. They also became quite arrogant and hostile to John and to the people in the church that they broke away from, uh, to anyone, in fact, that might cramp their style or bring a bit of truth into the situation. John had been working hard for years, as I said, and now seeing this church ruined through bad theology, bad belief, through heresy, was heartbreaking. And so when we understand all this as the context of these three letters, we understand why John writes the particular things he writes about. And as we saw, beginning with Jesus, the eternal word of life that was with the Father from the beginning, that he appeared to us, us is the disciples who followed Jesus. They saw him, heard him, touched him. And it is in this Jesus that they, we see, have been proclaiming ever since. And in verse 3, it's Jesus that is the basis of this fellowship that they enjoy within the church. But there's more to it than just fellowship with each other. It's even fellowship they have with God, the Father, and with Jesus himself through the Spirit. The Christian fellowship is, is triangular in a sense. It's my life in fellowship with Christ. It's your life in fellowship with Christ. And then we have that fellowship that we share. The common thing we share is Christ. Each, the union of each follower that they enjoy with Christ binds the church together. In verse 4, John adds that the result of this fellowship will be joy. Makes our joy complete. So as well as the divine and the human dimension of Christ that we've seen here, there's also a moral dimension. We see that in verse 5 where John says that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Light is good, pure, holy. Darkness reverse to sin and evil. And so in verse 6 we see John countering the claim of these false teachers that they can have fellowship with the God of light, yet their actions show that they are walking in the darkness. He says you can't do that. But if you walk in the light, verse 7, as he is in the light, we experience two things, he says there. One is genuine fellowship with one another, 
Love for others is the product of our love for God. Fellowship with each other is the proof of our fellowship with God. You know, amen on that one? You know, a bit Pentecostal here. <laughs> Stand on the chair or something. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> but the second thing we see here, it's a wonderful thing, that we not only have this fellowship with God, with one another, but we are being purified from all sin through the blood of Jesus. Being purified through God's forgiveness is how we begin our walk with him, and that's our walk of fellowship with each other. But it's not a one-off thing. Confession and receiving God's forgiveness has to be a regular thing. I don't know who's been perfect this week. Now, we prayed a prayer of forgiveness at the end of last, of, of confession last week. Oh, well, I, you might, I don't know what you prayed, but I left that time open in response to how awesome our God is. It's been a week if you haven't been perfect. Have you prayed a prayer of confession this week? Is that part of your practice? Are you aware of stuff? It's, it's important because... We've got the security of being in God's family, praise God. And we're going to look at uh, you know, that this we can be sure of eternal life. But just have little issues can rise within our fellowship that's going to damage our relationships a bit. That means we not, haven't left the church or anything. You know, there's just a bit of sandpaper happening between us. We can't help that. And so confession, what it does is restore fellowship. You haven't fallen away from Christ. You haven't deserted it. But that's why it's important because it just brings that back, that renewal, restoring the right. It's good to make up, isn't it? Good to make up. It does. Absolutely, Mark. Yeah. And so it's a continual thing. Part of walking in the light is confession. John confronts the next Gnostic claim here, that they are without sin. And it's a bit wider than that. They thought that the nature of humanity was not sinful, yet we understand from Scripture that the nature of humanity is basically sinful. Uh, in fact, they even thought that they, they could not sin. They were sinless. Now, at best, that's just you know, mind-boggling self-deception. But the reality is it's a bald-faced lie that shows, as John says, the truth is not in them. Now, even if you excluded the body, which they did, as, you know, the things I do in the body can't be sinful because that doesn't matter. What about the whole area of our thought life and our attitudes? Uh, isn't that where the battle rages? But... These false teachers just refuse to take sin seriously. They consider themselves Christian, um, but there was no need to confess and repent. And now they were teaching others to follow them, which is the tragedy. Now, Christ's death did not mean much to them because they didn't think that they needed Christ's shed blood to purify them. And therefore, according to verse 8, and 10 there, we see that they deceive themselves. The truth is not in them. And they make Jesus out to be a liar by doing that. Because he calls people to confess and repent as they follow him. And so his word is not in them. Come down to uh, 2 verse 3. And John continues countering these false Gnostic claims with a play on words, actually, that the Gnostics would not appreciate. Uh, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. 
we know that the word know is that word nosos, gnostic, that is the root word. So he's sort of having a bit of a dig, which they wouldn't have liked. They claim to know things specially. He's saying, well, you don't really know. John is saying that you only really know that you know Jesus by the evidence of obeying his commands. That's how you know. <laughs> Claiming knowledge, this nosos, of him in some sort of subjective, mystical experience while you disobey him is just rubbish. John doesn't hold back. Look at verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in that person. Yeah, this is pretty tough language he's saying. There's a lot at stake, though. Truth is at stake, and the gospel is at stake. He's a bit worked up. I think that's okay. In uh, verses 5 and 6, John puts a simple but clear logical test to these liars. This is how we know him. We are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Jesus was holy and humble. The Gnostics were promiscuous and proud. And when John says, I'm not writing a new command, but an old one you have had from the very beginning, verse 7. Now, you could go back to Leviticus in Deuteronomy. Uh, Leviticus is the first book in the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, you can see there the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus was challenged about the greatest command, what did he say? Love God, for hearts and minds, love your neighbor as yourself. He's referring back to the Old Testament. So it's pretty old. And yet, <laughs> a bit confusingly, then he says in verse 8, Oh, no, no I am writing a new command. It, just, it does make the reading of the whole thing a bit tricky, doesn't it? Um, but how is it new? Well, it's new in the sense that Jesus radically amped up, as it were, what love means. In defining love, how did he define love? Well, uh, it's not just loving those that you like. Anyone can do that, the Bible says. But loving your enemies in, in the Sermon on Mount Matthew 5, in, in loving those who persecute you. It, it, it's not just the neighbor. It's the neighbor that's trying to do away with you. Love them. Uh, he demonstrated this level, this type of love, this degree of love when he died. They're banging the, the nails into his hands. What do you say? Oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's a whole new level, isn't it? And we see that that is the truth, the truth of this love that we, in verse 8, we see in him. And it's the same love that he says that we see in you. These are his dear friends that have hung on to the true faith and the loving and the sacrificial service and the fellowship that they share together. He's seen their love, their love for the Lord and their love for him as he loves them. Uh, this command to love is also bringing in a new era. Jesus' perfect love broke the power of darkness, we see in verse 8 there. And it established the kingdom of light. We see all sorts of horrible stuff going on in our world, don't we? But be assured, Satan was defeated on the cross. He's still active. He's still prowling. But he knows his fate. The victory has been won. The, the light has dawned. And that changes everything. And therefore, living in the light means that we love each other, brother and sister, verse 10. And yet the Gnostics who claimed to be in the light of superior knowledge were actually not loving. They were tearing down and they were hating their former brothers and sisters. This lack of love is evidence that they are in the dark. And there is an implication in the original language here that, that they're not just in the dark, but, but they are condemned to walk the rest of their lives, chained, bound in this 
darkness because we see that the darkness has blinded them. It's a very sad situation that John is writing to. But sadly, it's not that rare, is it? The Gnostics claim to have special revelation uh, from God. And over the years, some of the scariest words I have ever heard around churches are, God told me. Things like, uh, you, you, not specifically, but generally, things like, you know, God told me that uh, for every dollar you put in the plate, you get 110% back. Oh. You know, that's a good one. God told me you should marry me. Even worse, yeah, you know, people have. I know this one. So God's told me that you should have sex with me. I'm the leader of this cult. And I know because I've got special revelation that you're just a pleb and you don't have. God told me that the world is ending on this certain day. Do you remember that one back in Ride? I remember years ago. What a laughing so. What about the one God told me that we're all going to hear die because the aliens are coming? That, I forget the name of that sect, sect. David Koresh, God told him that he should set up a community in Waco, Texas. If you remember back a bit further, what did God tell Jim Jones? Let's all move down to Guyana and commit mass suicide. See, it, it's pretty scary. You can see this Gnosticism. It's not dead. Uh, it invariably involves a power differential between people and it implies superior knowledge and that you can't question me because, well, God told me. It's often used to manipulate and abuse and excuse behaviour just as the Gnostics are doing here. Well, they run off with each other, whoever they want to do it. Now, God tells me, I've got to tell you, God tells me things every day. But he tells me the same things he tells you <laughs> because we all share the same word, Bible. I don't have exclusive knowledge. The access I have to what God tells me is the same access you've got to what God is telling all of us. It's not exclusive or secret. We've all got access to it. And that is why the Bible must be used to verify these many outrageous claims. See, the consequences of wrong beliefs of bad theology can be horrific. No wonder John is fighting so hard here for the truth, for the gospel to expose these charlatans and to protect, to shepherd his churches or God's churches that he oversees. And yet, as we, well, speak for myself, as I read this passage thoughtfully and prayerfully, we, I, couldn't help but recognize my own failure to walk fully in the light. Um, you know, sometimes we prefer the shadows, don't we, sadly? Because we think in the shadow we won't be exposed. Mm. We know that we have not fully and joyfully obeyed Jesus' good commands, in particular to love one another as I have loved you. We have not lived as Jesus did. And John just said that was, the, that was the proof, the evidence, if you're a follower of Christ. And yet I've got to put my hand up there. Does it make me a Gnostic? Does it make us failures? Well, yes, but not absolutely. 
See, self-aware, the self-awareness of failure, of our sin, of our disobedience, is what the false teachers here that are destroying the church, that is what they lacked, that self-awareness of failure. So to have that awareness of not living in all the fullness of what God has for us is a healthy place to be. And I say that intentionally. You know, there's, there's the, what is that, the, the positive and the negative way of looking at something. In a sense, we could say, oh, you know, I've, I've sinned and that's bad. And, yep, and the Spirit might convict you of that. Well, he will if, if you're walking with him. But we could also look at that same thing as God's got this full abundant life he has for us. And sin, as we know from the Greek, is just sort of falling short. But it's, it's falling short of God's standard. But think of sin as falling short of the fullness that God wants for us, for the liberty and the freedom that he has for us. Not just I've done the wrong thing, but I've sort of missed out on the, on the great thing. So being aware of that is a healthy place to be. You know, sometimes when people, I'm you know, sharing with people and, and well, they're sharing with me about some of their spiritual struggles, um, perhaps temptations they're wrestling with, and, and we're having a chat, and, um, and they'll, they'll, they'll talk about these things, and, I'll, and I'll, sometimes I'll say, well, that's encouraging. And I get this bewildered look that I'm seeing now on faces. <laughs> But I explain that the struggle is invariably, is usually evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. The fact that you're struggling means that you're trying to do something about it. And particularly with, with newer Christians, I say, well, was that thing that you're struggling with um, today, was that an issue, uh, you know, three months ago when you weren't a Christian? And they go, well, no, not really. it didn't really matter then. I say, praise God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's doing his work, bringing conviction and doing that work to make us more like him. He's doing his job in the struggle. Now... <laughs> But we do let ourselves down. We do let God down. And so we do have to come uh, in confession, in repentance, to get that forgiveness that purifies us, to renew that fellowship that might be damaged, and to seek his strength in overcoming. See, what does John write there back in verse 8? If we claim to be without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. and The truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. But he, he continues there in chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that doesn't mean the whole world's forgiven. We don't believe in universalism. We believe in the reality of Christ did of a real heaven and a real hell, but the potential is there that people can avail themselves of that forgiveness. But if we believe what John's just written in, all that Christ has done for us, if confession is our practice and forgiveness, therefore, is our experience, it makes an enormous difference in everything. We live in this, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a paradox, but the reality is confession will keep us humble before God and before each other. 
Well, at the same time, forgiveness, knowing that we're forgiven, will give us confidence. We have this humility and confidence. Confidence to make a fresh start and not to be racked with shame and guilt, but to move on. That is why Christian testimony is so powerful. It's so unique because people will stand up the front and, and, and they'll say the most horrible things about themselves. <laughs> and, and if testimony is about God, what God's done in a person, but they'll do that then without the shame and guilt. That, that they've exposed their soul, which can be quite graphic. And we go, well, in any other context, we'll be, oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I never forget when we were in Italy, the, uh, we found out Lauren's Sunday school teacher. Uh, you know, we sent her off to, to Sunday school e each morning and we found out about halfway through the time there that her Sunday school teacher was a bank robber, been in armed hold-ups, went to jail and got extra time in jail for bad behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> you see the freedom from that stuff, from the guilt and the shame that we have through confession and receiving forgiveness. It's wonderful. So good belief, right, and good theology is a great relief. Uh, but it also has these ripple effects of good actions, uh, good values, good actions, good behavior, good words, good speech, good tone. That's going to mean good relationships, and it's going to be good for us, but also all those around us. This is what John is trying to combat. And good theology, good belief, brings unity, not division. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for your spirit who brings that Awareness of the reality of our sin. But that glorious certainty and amazing transaction of being forgiven, made pure by being washed through him to stand before you righteous. In your precious name.